Welcome to Thoughts Roundup. Well, I'm doing something just a little bit different today, folks. Uh, I'm here with Brother Phillips in Mississippi, and he has interviewed me. And you're always seeing me interview someone else, but I would like to see the, it turned around and see, you can see how I react whenever I'm being interviewed. So here we go. Uh, welcome. I had I had the privilege to have Brother Marler preach for us tonight, and I know a lot of people know Brother Marler, and uh, I actually grew up in Dallas, and I remember when my parents, for a little season, went to the church there in what? Uh, Is Dallas? Was it Dallas then? It, when it was in Dallas, uh, and before they built the building that they sold and they're in the building now. I think Brother Stan was the pastor there. And uh, I was directly connected to the church through my friends as I was growing up in the area and my parents attended that church. Yeah. And uh, so I'm glad to have you here today. I'm glad to be with you, my brother. Absolutely. So I just thought I would ask you just some simple questions. They would have to be some. <laughs> so... How old were you when you were born again, baptized? And fifteen. You're fifteen. What city did that happen in? City. <laughs> I was out in the country, and I was at Heinston, Louisiana, about two miles from Heinston. And the closest we ever come to having heavy industry was a 300-pound Avon lady. <laughs> so that tells you about where I was. That's funny. So. Um, what caused you to go to church? What somebody invite you? Oh no, my folks. Uh, my mother got the Holy Ghost and Dad in 1926. Okay, and that's all we knew. Okay, and uh, it, we way back to where sometimes we had to walk is two and a half miles, and sometimes we went in a wagon. Okay, and every once in a while we'd have a car run enough to. Okay, uh, get. so how old were you when you preached your first sermon? Oh, uh, let's see, let's see, uh, probably 26. Okay, so yeah. So you didn't just start preaching when you were no. just a, a young man? No, no. Okay. I, I spent four years in the Navy before that. And what year were you in the Navy? Years were you in the Navy? 52 to 56. Okay, so that's post-Korean War? No, I, the fact is I, I, I was over there when it, in Korea when it ended. Okay. No war yeah, I, I'm very familiar with uh, the dates and a lot of events of yeah. World War II, but I don't know as much about the right. Korean War, which right. is probably true for a lot of people. Yes. Uh, well, that. So, how old are you? I'm 88, <laughs> going on a 220. <laughs> oh wow! Well, congratulations, huh? Thank you. And you, you, you're 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 on the road all the time. Yes. Yes. Wow. Yes. I, I I related to someone that I thought you were older than my dad, which my dad is 78, and so I was right. Yeah. Well, let's, I hope I can still get around at 88. Well, you know, I'm slow. My walking is slow. It's been slow for about a year. I don't know what to mm -hmm. Well, about 88 might have something to do with it. Well, it might, but I got sick and ever, ever since then. It's, it's been that way. But as long as I can get around, I'm not going to fuss. Yeah. Keep well, going. You know, I was telling someone the other day, I am 54, and uh, it, it's happened so fast. Yeah. And uh, I, t I told someone, I said, I, 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 I really dread the days when I have a message to preach and know where to preach. Yes. They asked me, somebody asked me, said, how long are you going to go? I said, till I can't get there or they quit asking me. Oh, there you go. I never call anybody and ask them to let me preach for them. And yeah. If nobody asks me, well, if y'all want me off the field, just, <laughs> just stop asking. Just stop asking. <laughs> wow, that's something. So I know this is going to be a hard, a hard question to answer. It may be easy. What is the most impacting message that you can remember hearing? Hearing? Yeah, on yourself personally. A message that just really was transformational for you. 
hearing somebody preach. Right, right. Uh, well, that is a, a kind of a, let me just say it like that. I'm not saying that it impact me because I, I was kind of older and so forth and so on, but I heard J.T. Pugh preach your first night in hell. Oh. And uh, then I also heard George Glass preach about when the devil, uh, uh, when, when God takes a weapon out of the hands of the devil and beat you, beats him over the head with it. <laughs> and now he might have said it a little nicer than that. And then I also heard uh, Brother Gidrow's preaching the death march to hell. Mm. I, it's odd that I had two sermons about hell and I'm not have a fixation on it right. preaching for that but it, that was two sermons that the death march to hell that, I've heard of the, your first night in hell and I've heard of the death march I had never heard of the uh, yeah I was sitting there when they preached it so uh, I, I have listened to a lot of J.T. Pugh uh, after he passed um, uh, and, and, and I personally enjoy his particular style of preaching, mm -hmm. listening to it while you're driving down the road and working in the yard. And I have listened to it a lot. In fact, the, my, my oldest and dearest friend's name is Kevin Shindall. And uh, J.T. Pugh is his favorite uh, preacher. And he's got as many as sermons are available on the Internet. He has them. He has them. Now, his sir, preaching changed a little. You know, a little bit right. after you went to headquarters, started working, and you more of it went into more of a teaching mode for a while. Mm -hmm. But he, when he got through with that, he could see still had the yeah. the same old good yeah. way of doing that. Yeah. Well, he, he was a uh, uh, you know had, had clear throat. <laughs> uh, yeah, I heard him preach a sermon one time. I started to mention it a while ago. The Christly art of dying and staying dead. Mm. And mm. it was quite a sermon. I guess so. Yeah. I guess so. So uh, what is the most memorable, maybe a few memorable messages that you preached that you, you remember? Well, I have to kind of go by what people say. Right. And because uh, I... I couldn't evaluate most stuff. Right, right. But people remember and ask for the scent of water. I think I've heard you preach Maybe. that. It was a long time ago. I think you preached it at uh, Brother Crafts. It still then. keeps coming back up. And even though I don't ever hear preach it myself. Uh, right. But then uh, it keeps coming back up. And uh, then there's... Uh, another one or two that uh, the echo comes back I preached that and they've asked me to preach it at camps and so, so the, the echo comes back what, what's the kind of premise of it uh, well it's, it, it's kind of like uh, do unto others and you'll have it and do unto you I see and mm -hmm. do it and you'll, I'll have to write that down so you go yeah. see, if I, see if it's online somewhere I don't know. The echo comes back. I preached it in California not a few years ago. They asked me to preach it. So do you have a, a, a few books that you've read that you've recommended to people through the years? Uh, yeah, I'll I tell you what. I, I recommended a lot of Clovis Chapel. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I recommended uh, Morrison song. Mm -hmm. And, of course, there's another uh, that slips me right now, but it's right along the same time with Clovis Chapel. And, uh, but I, I am a f fan of T. D. Witt Talmadge. Okay. That's, that's the all-time man. And it's not to preach his stuff. Right. It feeds me. Yes, yes, yes. It feeds me. Yeah, I found that to be true. Uh, I, I, and when I was younger, I used to be quite an avid reader. I, but you know, as technology has changed, I really am more of a listener. I do a lot of audio. I don't see how you do it. Um, I don't see how you do it. It's to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, 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 I can really hear when I'm, li when I'm listening. I really 
I want to sit there with a book in my lap with an apple to eat or a popcorn, <laughs> Diet Coke. Right, right. And underline. Yeah. 88. I, I'm 88. Yeah, right, 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 right. Well, I, I, I'm thinking, I started pastoring in, I was it 97, and uh, up until about 2000, 2001, you know, the technology is really, up until that point, I read, I was a prolific reader, and, uh, but a, a physical books, but I'm much more of a listener because I can do it while I'm driving down the road. I can do it while I'm doing yard work. Yeah. And uh, I probably spend most of my devotional study time writing, do a lot of writing. Yeah. And I know you've written. How many books have you written? About 35. 35. About 35. Yeah. About 35. You need to take it. That's fine. Mm-hmm. That's all right. Yeah. He's, he's listening to you. Hello? Jason, uh, I'm making a interview right now. It's why I didn't just catch on with you. All right. Well, carry on. Well, well can I call you back uh, after church? 88. So if you think about uh, how the world has changed, what was the most uh, technologically advanced thing that happened when you were young that you remember? Well, you know, I remember the, the uh, first television that come in our country. Mm, what, 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 what was that about, the 50s? Oh, uh, yeah, in, in the, yeah, way back. Uh-huh. Uh, because I remember going my, over to my uncle's house and he had one, uh-huh. and it was just a bunch of snow uh-huh. and stuff. And there wasn't much to it. Yeah. Really. And, yeah. And, and all. And, and I got a feeling. Now, you know, whenever I, I, I we didn't have electricity, mm. much less a telephone. <laughs> right. Uh, we had to watch television by candlelight. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, what the deal was, uh, I was in the Navy. And the helicopter came and dropped a package down on the, the mail down on the deck. Uh, and uh, after a while, they sorted it and it, Marler! And I got a letter from Mama. Uh, and she said, Oh, see, we've got electricity. Uh, and she said, We've got a phone. Our number is 7932097. No, it just started off with 2097. Uh, and said, when you get to the port, it would be about almost a year. Uh, she said, give me a call. Oh, wow. That and, was something I bet. Yeah. And so to us, that was big. Used to, you could make a phone call if you went to Forest Hill and they had where they punch in stuff mm-hmm. and stuff. And, and you could pay and make a call somewhere. Yeah. But it had to be a really unneeded situation. It was not inexpensive. Yeah, plus nobody had any needs. Right. Well, then do you know somebody that can get to the phone, right? Or had a phone? Well, they didn't have... Well, you, it would have to be a business thing, probably. You had to make a call. Okay. Because people didn't... Most people didn't have phones, probably even up in the north where they were doing better. So, in your ministry, so you started preaching when you were 26, is that right? Or 25? 26. 26. And uh, do you remember, you remember your uh, first few messages you preached? I remember the first message I preached, Brother Mangan, give me, uh, uh, Carl McKellar, Kenneth Phillips, and myself, I think 10 minutes. Really? On Wednesday night. So you grew up with Kenneth Phillips. Yes. And so that sermon that I preached that night was the high cost of low living. Mm. The high cost of low living. Yeah, Kenneth and Carl. Okay. They they were my friends. And that's something. We went to Bible school in St. Paul, Minnesota in the same car uh, there. Wow. Isn't that something? So, did, I guess you evangelized after that? Whenever, at, at, how old were you when you started evangelizing? Well, you see, wife and I got married, 
before I really, I preached out a little bit and all, but to really get to going, it was whenever she and I got got married and, and we drove down from Moline, Illinois, down to Alexander where I lived and, and we, we started from there. Mm -hmm. So, pastoring, how many churches did you pastor? Well, too many. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I pastored a church in Days Out of Texas. And uh, then I went to uh, Dallas, Texas, okay. to start a new church. Right. And we didn't, like you mentioned a while ago, we didn't have, we didn't know one soul there. Hmm. And my wife had never been there. I'd made one trip to kind of scout out the area I thought we ought to go to. and But I had a deep feeling about going to Dallas. Hmm. And uh, so we got to Dallas, and we built a church. Now, I had $385 or $65 mm. is all I had. I sold my coin collection to my brother. Wow. And we drove That was a lot of money. Yes, yeah, it was a lot of money, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> what year are we talking about? And uh, I, I can't remember. But 60s, anyway, 60s. Uh, no, 60s. 60s. Way back in the 60s. Okay. And, and I'll tell you what we did. We built the church, and and nice church. It was a... I remember it. Okay. I've seen it, yeah. yeah. It's A-frame, right? Yeah, A-frame. Right. And then we built the, the, the back on it. We had, we had a fellowship hall back there. Right. And uh, four or five acres of land. Yeah. And uh, I've been there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember going there at, when it was just the A-frame before they built the, the metal building that was in front of it. They built a nice building. Yeah, it was. Big building. And I already had the bricks bought really? to build the next building because I wanted it to match. Right. And uh, so, but the church... Our, our biggest number, of course, it wasn't a consistent number, but uh -huh. 247. Wow. But in 10 years, and but the th thing about it is, uh, the truth of the matter is that the church has done very well since I left. Yeah, that's wonderful. It's a five, they had about 500 people there at one time. That's wonderful. Yeah, and of course they've sold out and moved. Yeah, I've been in their new building. In fact, my parents, when they lived in Dallas, they lived maybe two miles from yeah. the current location, uh -huh. and uh, it's it's a it's it's a it's a wonderful church. They really have great worship. And oh, I'm I'm so I'm so thankful for that. Nice. I remember my wife and I wouldn't be somewhere, and not much happened on Sunday night. Nobody gets saved. Mm -hmm. One of us would say, well, maybe they did some good in Dallas tonight. <laughs> <laughs> because we knew it wouldn't have been there if we hadn't gone. So right. It wasn't taking advantage, uh, you know. I mean, sure. So, just, so how long? You were there 10 years? Is that 10 right? years. And then if I remember, you became the home mission director. Home mission director full time. Right. Yes. And how long did you do that? About two and a half or three years, I okay. imagine. And uh, it... it the job was my cup of tea, but a lot that went with it was not. Sure, I, I, the job. I, I've done enough of that kind of thing to understand. I, I, it, it's, it's, uh, it's somebody's got to do it. That's right. And, but I'm glad it's not me. And we did a lot of good. We yeah, did a lot of right, good. And right. I thank the Lord for it. But, but, uh, so anyway, uh, I left there and went to Flint, Michigan. Mm. Burr. For Flint, so what did you do in Flint, Michigan? I pastored uh, more. Uh, I pastored more. Well, I I renamed it to More Life Tabernacle. Okay. And uh, I forget what the other was. I I, I just have to think. And uh, is that the church that's there in Flint now? Uh, there they moved it. Okay. To a little another to another location, and but their South Flint Tabernacle. Okay. Nate Wilson, Pastor right. of South Flint. Where Brother Henson and I guess his son. Brother Henson, yeah, right. them. And uh, he had a great church. Yeah. He had a great church there, and we did too. We had yeah. just a, 
uh, we went from about 88, I think, to over 300. That's awesome. But it wasn't all just revival. It was like people come back and this and that. Yeah. But uh, nevertheless, it was a great church, a spiritual church. Well, I obviously don't know this, but my observation seems to be that a lot of our big city churches have historically been a testimony to the strong work happening in their rural towns. Yeah. People grow up, want to move, and they move to the big city. Move to town. And uh, are a blessing to the churches in the city. Yeah, well, and they had the, the Chevrolet dealership, uh, the plants there. Right. And everything. I was so stupid. I remember buying a new car there, and everybody worked for the GM or... And I went and bought a Chrysler. Oh, no. How did that look? Uh, uh, people... And they probably took offense to it, huh? Well, they didn't let me know it. Uh, but but I sure... I should have had a kick it. Yeah, well... <laughs> Uh, uh, the, the he that hath not done things, done dumb things, uh, cast the first dumb stone, right? That's right. Yeah, I, I hope, hope that's right. I, I, I should have been beat by uh, and stoned many times. I've made uh, more than my fair share. And, and that when I bought the car, the gas went sky high. How high was that? Do you remember? 83 cents a gallon. We couldn't afford it. Nobody, everybody was just shocked. Eighty, and that was that was that's when. How, how much do you think? I, I mean, what, how much was a, was a gallon of milk back then? Uh, or something that we could I relate to? I don't know. I what year was that? That wow. was seven. Uh, I think I went there in seventy three. Okay. And I was there in '76. Yeah, okay. Because that's by Centennial or something. Yeah, so that was when Carter was president, or oh, I, I can't remember who was there, but boy, I want to tell you what there was gas lines and fights. I remember all gas this, lines. all the way south and everywhere. Boy. I remember being in a, I think it was a Kipps Big Boy or Denny's. Yeah, and we were. I was just a little bit of kid, I, it, and it was when uh, uh, Reagan was running against. Yeah. Carter and I just remember this hearing the people behind us talk about who they should vote for between Carter and Reagan and I mean I, I, it's such a vivid memory I can see the orange uh, uh, vinyl uh, booths and I mean I, I'm there and I, I remember people that I don't have many memories because my parents were not political they never talked about politics but I do remember that so <clears throat> what is the best advice that anybody ever gave you? Uh, I probably can't answer that. Oh, oh. Well, I just don't know. I just don't Yeah, know. just didn't come to mind. I mean, I'm asking random questions, so. Yeah, I just, I, I really w don't know. Mm -hmm. I really don't know. I think the best advice I ever heard that helped me um, I was in the process of accept accepting my call to preach and. Uh, in that, I had a relationship that broke, and I uh, went to my pastor's wife, which was Lila Lane, and I was, you know, really t torn. And she said, uh, "She said, Scott, God gives His best to those who leave the choice to Him." Uh, and long story short, not long after I got married, my mother-in-law gave me a little plaque, and it said. That. God gives his best to those who leave the choice to him. And I would say probably that was what That's it. Well, I, you know, I believe I read probably the uh, best advice I got that I can think of. It said, whenever you're making a list of your friends, put yourself on it. Uh, because, you know, we have a tendency to, yeah. no matter how loud we talk, we might have a tendency to think we're kind of nothing and nobody really. Mm -hmm. But I, that was good advice for me. I heard, uh, I think it was uh, Brother David Hale, one time he was doing a minister's seminar in Brandon. Yeah. And he was making a point. He said, uh, don't apologize for having an ego. He said, God gave you that ego. Your key is to keep it in control. Control. But yeah. no one's ever done anything for God or the kingdom that didn't have some sense of... The mealy mouse don't make it. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was... Because I do, I recognize I, I have a have a pretty healthy ego, right? 
<laughs> I mean, I'm sitting here talking on a camera. You have to have some sense that I have some value. Well, when you invited me, what did I say? Uh, you okay. Say, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right, right. Well, I think most preachers, they have to have some yeah. some sense that, you know, you, you know, why else would you get up and think people need to listen to you for 30 yeah. minutes or more? Yeah. Because you have some value to add. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Well, um, you have anything you'd like to talk about? No, I'll just say that this is a beautiful church, and uh, I think it would be good for you to give the address in case some, there may be people coming through here yeah. uh, va on vacation right, and right. so forth. And so my name's Scott Phillips, and I pastor Spring Ridge Pentecostal Church in Raymond, Mississippi. Uh, we came here in 2003 and started our first service in 2004. We've been here at over 20 years, yeah. and now we started in Clinton. We now are in Raymond. And you can see it from this road is 18. Highway 18, Spring Ridge Road, 3453, yeah. Sunday morning, Sunday School 10, worship at 11, Wednesday nights at 730. And we're looking forward to having you here. You know, I've known of you. I, I don't know that I've ever shaken your hand before because I'm not... Well, I did earlier today, but you know, uh, but I, you know, you pre you were friends with Brother Craft, yes. So I heard you preach there. I've, I've got a few of your books. You said you've written thirty six books, thirty five, thirty five. Books. My wife wrote them, thirteen. Yeah. Wow. So, so was that something individually you did, or did you have other peers in your group that wrote books as well? No, I just did it. You just felt the impulse to do it. Yeah. And that's something. Yeah, I just did it. And, 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 that's rare. There are not many of us uh, apostolics that are writers. Yeah. I'm fighting right one right now because I know I, I I may not make it to uh, see it all through. And yeah. I'm just not probably going to ever do it. But I've had to, several even this week to ask me if I was going to. But so what is the book that you're writing about now? About, I'm not writing about it. Uh, would you need to? Oh, oh, it would just be a Western, I imagine. Okay. I, people want me to do my life story, but I just somehow know that that don't interest me. I think you probably, the way to accomplish that is have someone essentially sit down with you and ask, right and ask you questions. Yeah. And uh, someone basically take what you said, kind of like in, you know, we. I know people did it with Brother Craft. They'd sit down and kind of ask yeah, a question. Yeah. And he would talk to the camera. Yeah. And uh, of course, you've done quite a bit. I mean, I don't know how many how many videos that you've done, but I've seen a number of your yeah. videos through the. It's about seven hundred now. Pretty close to seven hundred. You've done seven hundred. Yeah, that's. that's yeah. So did you do one every week or every, every, every day? Month? I try to do one every day, but I miss it sometimes. Really? And well, and sometimes they're thin. And sometimes I, they don't. I didn't it's, know that. Just, so are, are you on YouTube? Yeah, I'm on YouTube and Holy Ghost Radio. Yeah. See, Holy Ghost Radio puts it on YouTube. Okay. That's the way it goes. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to look and I'm going to subscribe. So just search for O.C. Marler on uh, YouTube and, and I see a bunch of stuff. It's a thoughts roundup is yeah, the name of the program. I see it. Episode 423, 658. Wow, that's... Man. You got more than that. Yeah. You know, uh, my, my observation is, uh, I see this in my own life, that if you do something consistently, it really becomes something after a period of time. Yeah. You know? And uh, I think a lot of people never start because they, you know, they they might not value that they have something to contribute. I was sitting uh, there yesterday or day before yesterday was at the eclipse, mm. and I was disinterested, really. I didn't care about. It. And uh, so the pastor woke up and said, "Brother Martin, do a program. It's almost over." Okay. I put my camera on fixed, got it, and. and Put what was left on it, right? And did you know within six hours, I believe it was, I had fourteen hundred views. Hey, every, the eclipse captured people's imagination. It did, yeah, too. absolutely. It was and kind of a positive thing, you know. Somebody actually talking about something that's not political, and it was something though that God set in motion at the beginning, mm. and it's just right. <laughs> it's not in the phenomena right. of right. something that's just happened to cause it. Right. Well, they know they know the date of the next one. I think it's 20 years. 20 years? Oh, I thought For, it was a lot longer than that. Yeah, I, think, I looked it up. I think it's about 20 years till the next full eclipse. 
Uh, you, you take care of it for me, will you? <laughs> well, I hope Jesus has come by then. Well, I think he will be. Uh, you know, I, I remember, you know, prophecy in time, mm-hmm. the coming of the Lord was yeah. quite a yeah. regular theme. Yeah. Uh, when I was growing up, they uh, they were showing films. They, they bring in like the reel to reel and show the film on the wall. And uh, I remember uh, oh, having a deep dread that, that I'd been left behind. I was preteen. When, and I remember, I don't know how many times I came home and my mom and dad weren't there. We need to keep that feeling. Yeah, yeah. That's, we need to keep that feeling. Yeah. Not for fear's sake, but for respect and of the fact that it could happen. Yeah, seeing that we therefore have these precious promises. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The coming of the Lord is a... Yeah. You know, if, it, if there's ever been a time of prophetic fulfillment, we're right dab in the middle of it. Right over there. Yeah, and, I, and I, it, it, we, they were there in the 70s. <laughs> they were there in the 80s. And we're just, uh, I think there was a song, I remember my mother playing on the record player, One Day Closer to the Kingdom. Yeah, I remember hearing that. Yeah, that makes every day better than the day before. The day before, yeah. I can make it through today. Knowing that tomorrow I'll be one day closer, closer to, to the shore. shore. Yeah. yeah, you know, I think I, I, I grew up uh, in an apostolic church. My dad was raised Church of Christ, and my mother was a backslidden Pentecostal, and they got married, which no one would recommend that. <laughs> But they got married. I had a great grandmother. She got the Holy Ghost and went to church in Woden, Texas, her whole life. And I'm sure you've preached in Woden, Texas. Yeah, I, I'm not sure who was the pastor. I think Brother McLean was the pastor mm-hmm. there. Okay. And I think a Brother McLean started the church. And uh, the, the building that's there now in Woden is actually the home place where my great grandmother was. I see. And so. Uh, that's kind of a sacred spot. Yeah, I hadn't been in years. I've seen I've seen pictures, but uh, so my great grandmother prayed my mother and father into the kingdom. No doubt about that. She's one of these old ladies. Well, she wasn't old then. Uh, uh, when she died, the 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 funeral director called the family back and pulled up the hem of her skirt, and she had like these thick calluses on her knees mm. and she was one of these ladies that she'd get the dinner ready she'd get praying uh, over the food and she'd say y'all go ahead and go eat and she'd go back there and pray for her family she'd get under burden for her lost family and uh, when I was little I didn't like people like that because they keep you from eating too long <laughs> <laughs> yeah I don't think that'd be very popular today either no right yeah my my folks all get around the table and a lot of time they get to worshiping instead of eating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, there's an element that that existed in that generation, yeah. and it's probably just it's probably impossible because people are just not this. And I don't know. I just know I've seen my great grandmother, and I've pastored. You know, people from the World War II generation, yeah. and they're just when you've been through the depression and you've been through the World War and you've been through the threat of nuclear war. Mm. And you've seen all the, the the miraculous provision, and you grow up poor, and you know we most of us in America today have grown up very. Yeah, afflu- we were very fluent now. Anyway, yeah. I may not have grown up in affluence, but compared to how my parents were raised, you know, we always had food. You know, we never got cold. We always had food. We had enough. It may not have been what we wanted, but we had enough. Mm-hmm. That's, That's the way it was. Well, I think I, I think I've reached the bottom of my bucket. I'm on my questions. I I I, I, uh, I love I love to ask uh, elders questions that just kind of come to my mind. Oh, thank you, um, and I appreciate the time. Well, I've enjoyed the program. I enjoyed being absolutely, with you. Absolutely, and looking forward to being in service tonight. Absolutely, sound like we have perfect timing. Somebody's coming in the door. It's time. Amen. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank y'all for joining us. If you enjoy this, share it with your friends. Post it on your wall. Send it on Twitter. And uh, subscribe to Brother Marler's uh, Thoughts Roundup. Thoughts Roundup on YouTube. And uh, thank you, Elder. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Absolutely.